I want to talk this morning about the final day in history. You know, we look back through our history books and, and, and we can glean information from various days in history. There may be days in your life that you look back upon as days in history and you remember certain events or certain things. But there's going to be a time that comes and it is going to be the final day of history. In other words, as far as time is concerned, there will not be another day. This will be it. The final day of history. Now, we uh, have experienced uh, finality in this life. We, we've experienced times in which it was the final game of the season or, or the final uh, day of the season, hunting season or something, or, or final something. We, we're familiar with that too. But the final day of history, to me that should be an attention gather to us. It's referred to as the day of the Lord in the passage that was read a moment ago. And it is a recurring biblical theme. It's given prominence in this remarkable chapter, <coughs> pardon me, in which Peter, uh, we have uh, the writing here. It is mentioned by, uh, well, it's, it's variously denominated in Scripture. For instance, it's termed as the day of the Lord or the day of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 8. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5 and Philippians chapter 1 and verse 16. It's also recognized as the day of the Lord in chapter 12 of our reading this morning. The last day, John chapter 6 and verse 39. The day of visitation, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. The day of judgment, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 15. The great day, Jude, verse 6, or you can count it chapter 1 and verse 6. The day of wrath, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Romans chapter 2 and verse 5. Now these are some of the ways into which the final day in history is noted as far as titles concerned. In our study this morning, and if time continues tonight, we're going to take first of all and look at this chapter uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to lay some foundation work for some of the thoughts that we're going to look at in a little more detail tonight. But I want to give us a little bit of overview here of these things and then get into more general teachings as far as other passages are concerned. First of all, as we look at verses 1 and 2 of this chapter, note, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the, uh, the commandments of us, the apostles, of the Lord Jesus, or, or the Lord and Savior. Now, first of all, he begins by saying, now, I want you to remember that the things that I'm going to be talking about here as I begin this section of writing, through inspiration, he writes, these are earlier given from two distinct sources. This is not just something that the writer has come up with on his own here. He wants to cite two specific important sources into which this has already been set forth. First of all, the Holy Prophets. Now when he talks about the Holy Prophets, he is referencing the documents of the Old Testament. He's looking back at the Old Testament and he is saying, now, here you have inspired writings of old into which these things that I'm going to talk to you about have already been noted. In other words, God through inspiration has already spoken about these events of old. He's already prophesied about these things. But then he gets a little more close to their day and time there. In Luke 24, verse 44, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now Jesus says, as He references back to the Old Testament, all of these things that have been prophesied in the Old Testament concerning Him, and this last day in history concerns Him, 
He says, all of these things will come to pass. So not only did the Old Testament uh, cite these things, but Jesus, looking back, says all of these things are going to be fulfilled. But then he says now, concerning the apostles. He says, the apostles also, as they went on in the Lord's teaching, said, the last day, the final day of history is coming. And they give insight concerning it. In 2 Peter chapter 3, here in verse 8, as was read earlier, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. God looks at things differently from some perspectives than we do because we do not understand <coughs> eternal as God understands and knows. We do, we're not familiar with timelessness as God is. For God, there is no time to His existence. He has always been and He always will be. Their time is not in relation to such. But we relate things to time. We relate uh, our, our jobs, certain recreational things. Or what we relate it to time. We relate the birth of a child to time. Sometimes it doesn't come soon enough. Sometimes it lasts a while. Time. We're familiar with it. But eternity? God is familiar with that. He looks at things on a totally different scale than we do. Now, Secondly, look with me at verses 3 and 4 as we continue to, to give a little insight from this chapter. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now the Lord Himself declared that He would come again. In John chapter 14 and verse 3, he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Now that's a promise from Jesus. From the Son of God, deity himself. I will come again. Now for anyone to say that that's not going to happen, they are calling the Lord himself a liar. And it's not good to call anyone a liar. I was on the phone yesterday with a particular company and, and, and I was dropping a, 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 a matter that I had had with them. And, uh, oh, why, why are you dropping this? Well, I don't use it. You know, I, I don't I want it. It doesn't warrant. The time I put in doesn't warrant having it. Oh, well, well you, you, you probably do spend enough time on it. Yeah, you don't realize it, but you do. What? I think I ought to know how much time that I put into this or don't. <laughs> I always say, I want to speak to your supervisor and see what they say about you calling me a liar. No, I did. <laughs> but we don't like being called a liar, do we? How do you think the Lord feels about that? Do you think Jesus appreciates people calling him a liar and saying, Oh, you're not going to come again? I know you said you were, but you're not. Of course. That's nothing new to him because he said he's the Son of God and he proved it by miracles. People says, you're not the Son of God. One of these days, they're going to have to answer to him for that. But here, when you look, he says there are those in terms of the scoffers. Scoffers. These scoffers. And that's the, the type of actions that they're carrying out. And say, well, you know, you say he's going to come again. But, but where is his coming? Of course, this is reinforced by numerous passages in the New Testament. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 23. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 14. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7 and following. And many other passages reiterate this truth. But, there were those false teachers in that day and time who said, well, where is the promise of His coming? They look back and they say, you know, all of these days and years of history have gone by. And he hasn't come. So where is his coming? Well, you see, we, we could get into some logical 
matters and, and lay out this argument. But the fact is, without getting into all of that, who are they to say, because he has not come, he won't come? He didn't promise to come on any particular day that he uh, set before them, and that day passed, and so they could say, well, he said he'd come on this day, and he didn't come. So he's not coming. He lied. He didn't do that. The Lord made no promises to such. They sought to fortify their mockery here by appealing to the general regularity of nature. I say general regularity of nature since the time of creation. Because you see, in this uh, argument, uh, the argument is essentially naturalistic. And it contends for a uniformitarianism uh, that rejects the possibility of divine intervention in the affairs of the earth. And they're saying, well, all you have to do is look back from the beginning. And everything has gone on as it always has. And some of you, are, your members here uh, regularly, you probably heard me in the class mention this. But they say, you know, the sun always comes up in the east. It sets in the west. And you have the night and then the sun comes up in the east again and sets in the west. You know, all of this has gone on. You know, we really haven't had any uh, major matter of such that you're talking about this happened since the very beginning. Now, if their argument were true, which it's not, but even if their argument were true, it still would not prove that the Lord is not going to come again. History's record does not prove that He will not come again. But the fact is, their argument is false. It's a lie. Because the writer goes on there, and uh, he begins to talk about some matters. And he begins to discuss some things. But, you know, apparently, uh, they denied the coming of the Lord. Uh, you know, they didn't want to have to answer to God. They didn't want moral responsibility. And we heard this in a couple of our Wednesday night series that we have two more left uh, concerning creation versus evolution. But a couple of times in that series, if you noted, if you listened carefully, you heard this idea of moral responsibility. You know, people don't want to accept creation because they don't want to accept God as the Bible teaches, because they do not want to be responsible. They do not want to be accountable to Him. You see, people want to live like they want to live. They want to do what they want to do. They want to act and talk the way they want to. And they don't want to be responsible or accountable to anyone. Well, these scoffers, obviously, they live in a day in which uh, a lot of them were involved in, in, in lustful matters. Well, they didn't want to give that up. They didn't want to have to admit that there is a true and living God that they're going to have to answer to. And the apostle says, they are going to be troublemakers for you saints. And that was happening. That was going on right then. They're going to be troublemakers. And, you know, obviously the admonition indicates that the recipients of Paul's letter was living in the last days. Well, we are living in the last days. And so, as Peter talks about this matter, we realize that, you know, that admonition that these scoffers are going to be troublemakers, they're going to be troublemakers today. And they are. As we have <coughs> looked into our series concerning creation versus evolution, that the evolutionists are trouble for we who follow God. They want to cause problems. They want to cause trouble. In fact, they want to put us out of existence. They want everyone to believe what they want to believe. They want to change everyone. And so we face trouble as well, just like they did then. But now, look at his response here, beginning with verse 5 and going through verse 7. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 
Now, the first thing he seeks to do here is show their argument as being erroneous. They say, well, you know, you go back from day one and everything's just gone on like it always has. And he says, no, it has not. And so, you know, as though God has not divinely intervened throughout any page of day of history, and he says, yes, he has. Well, their argument is, well, because there has been no supernatural intervention of God in any way from the point of day one in history on, then it's not going to happen in the future. Well, if there hadn't been, that still doesn't mean there won't be in the future. If God said there would be in the future, there would be. But their argument is false because he says there has been intervention. He says they are willfully ignorant of. Now, there are people today who are willfully ignorant of biblical truths. That may stem from a number of things. It may stem, like I mentioned, because they want to act a certain way and the Bible teaches against it. So I'm just going to be willfully ignorant that the Bible teaches that's a sin. I want to act this way. I want to talk this way. I want to live this way. And they're going to be willfully ignorant of what the Bible teaches. They turn their backs on it. It's there, but they do not want to see it. Many people, unfortunately, are living lives that they are, how would you say it? Try to get some of you uh, folks from our 90s and up banquet. You remember the song, Coming In on a Wing and a Prayer? That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to come in on a wing and a prayer. It's not going to happen concerning God. God has demands. He has commands as to how His people are to live and He expects that. If it does not happen, then they will receive His wrath. Period. But you have people that want to throw out a piecemeal offering to God and say, well, you know, uh, God, I, I believe in You and I love You, so, so you, you owe it to me to accept me at, you know, in those circumstances. No, He does not and no, He will not. God will only accept those who are faithful to Him. Period. If I'm not being faithful to God and I have all this wishful thinking about when the last day of history comes that He's going to take me home to glory, then I, I better stop being willfully <coughs> ignorant of where my life stands before God and I need to come to Him in repentance and obedience. When we look here, these errorists were willfully ignorant of the lessons of history. God, by His Word, had created the world and the universe into existence. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and following. It is sustained by the Lord's Word, by the power of His Word. Colossians 1, and verse 17. Hebrews chapter 1, and verse 3. It's simply by His Word that it came into existence and by His Word that it all stays together and holds together and remains in existence. Because it is sustained by His Word. It is by His Word that it can be released and all be destroyed. As an argument for this promised judgment, Peter introduces to their attention, maybe brings back to their attention, the flood of Genesis chapter 6 through 8. And he says, now, you say things have gone on as they always had. You know, God's never had any major intervention of such nature. He says, okay, go back to Genesis chapter 6 and begin reading. You remember the flood? What happened then? Was that just a haphazard thing where it rained a little too much in one place? Not hardly. It was by the miraculous power of Almighty God that He says here the world was overflowed by water. He says they are willfully ignorant of They choose not to recognize such. And there are those today outside of the church who refuse to recognize what they need to do in coming to God. And there are those who are members of the church who refuse to recognize where their life stands because they haven't been faithful to His teachings. But that doesn't change anything. You know, we people have to come to an understanding. 
that simply because we refuse a truth or we ignore a truth, we need to understand that's not going to change the facts with God. You can say something's not true, but that doesn't change it. It is still true. Truth will always be true, whether we reject it or choose to accept it. By means of Jehovah's Word, he says here, the world was overflowed by water and it perished. Now I would say that's divine intervention, wouldn't you? I would say that goes against their argument and proves that they are willfully ignorant of history that God did. For the same word, he says, the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men will be ushered in. It's the same word that brought forth the waters from the deep and the waters from above and flooded the world. It's the same word that spoke it all into creation that is going to, in the last day of history, speak and destroy it. He will come again. It's interesting to note that the Lord Jesus also drew a parallel concerning the flood of Noah's days and the manner as far as judging the world. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 37 we find, And as were the days of Noah, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day of Noah entered into the, uh, the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them away. So shall be the coming of the Son of Man. While Noah all those years was building that ark, he was preaching the coming wrath of God upon man. And all those, say those eight who were saved in the ark, ignored it. Oh sure. Sure, God's wrath's going to come out. Sure, there's going to be a flood. Sure, this boat's going to be uh, the matter whereby, you know, everything inside is going to be saved. Oh, yeah, sure. Don't you know there were scoffers in those days and times as well? He says, I want to remind you that Jesus Himself used that parallel. He said, when He comes again, just as those in the days of Noah before the, the waters came forth, oh, they were just having a big time. They were enjoying their life. They were doing what they wanted to do. They were ignoring God. They weren't giving a submiss submissive obedience to Him. They were just doing what they wanted to do. They were going on their life. They didn't have to worry about anything they thought until the waters came forth. It is too late. He said it's going to be the same with the day of the Lord. The final day of history is going to be the same way. You know, people are going to be going about their business. There are going to be all these activities that are going to be transpired. People are going to be working. People are going to be playing. People are going to be sleeping. There's all types of things that are going to be going on. And then He's going to come. He will come. The same word. Now notice with me, verses 8 through 10, after he, he, he reminds these scoffers that they don't know what they're talking about and that they're willfully ignorant of history and of God's actions and the fact that just because they choose not to think it doesn't mean it's true. He goes on in verse 8 through 10 as was read earlier, and beloved, believe not, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And he tells them here, you know, when you look uh, concerning God, and you think, well, the earth has been going on all this time. In fact, today we can look and say, well, you know, it's been over 2,000 years since the Lord spoke these things that He was going to come again and He hadn't come. What's 2,000 years with God? To an eternal being that has always been in existence and always will be in existence, who is eternal, what's 2,000 years? That's a day. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but His long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, the works that are therein, shall be burned up. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, some men count slackness, but His long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, to be thankful. 
for the long suffering of God, for the patience of God. People who are not faithful to God, people who haven't obeyed God, members of the Lord's church that aren't faithful, we need to try to help them to come to an understanding of the biblical teaching that it is only by the long suffering of God that you have not yet been submitted to the wrath of God. And the long suffering of God is there for your salvation, but it won't be there forever. It's only through the long suffering of God that those who are lost have the opportunity even this day to change their life and to come to Him. It's only because of His long suffering. And it's interesting here. He says, uh, not willing that any should perish. Well, if you've studied the, the Calvinistic doctrine of predestination, you understand that that passage and that statement within that passage annihilates it. Because the Calvinistic idea of predestination has God, prior to the world, determining who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost without any effort, one way or the other, on that person's part. God has already judged them regardless of what they do in this life. That if God says, okay, you're going to be born and you're going to be saved, you can live however you want to, and you're going to be saved no matter what. Or if God says you're going to be lost, then it doesn't matter what you do in serving Him, you cannot be saved. Well, such is a lie. And Calvin's teachings on it is a lie. And this passage proves it's a lie because it says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, when God says He wants all to come to repentance, how could such a false teaching be true? It's not. It's false teaching. But we need to encourage people and help people understand. Especially you have people who, who, who have never known Christ or those who are members of the church and aren't faithful to God. We need to encourage and help them to see the truth of this reality that God's not willing that you perish. God wants you to be saved. And it's because of His long suffering that you haven't met Him yet. And you need to do something about it before the final day of history. In verses 8 through 10, time is meaningless with God. The people allow themselves to be lulled into a false sense of security. Not everything's all right, I'm not that bad. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a pretty good person. The Lord's going to give me time. I, I have some other things I want to do in life. And, and, and when the time's right, you know, he, He'll allow me to, to, to get my life straightened out with Him. Who are we fooling but ourselves? We need to come back to reality. We need to realize these teachings from the Word of God. We need to be constantly ready as the ten virgins, the parable of the virgins there in Matthew chapter 25. There were those that were ready, and we need to be ready all the time. The day is coming. It will occur at an unexpected time. Matthew 25 and verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Will you be prepared to do that? Are you prepared right now to do that? What if this is the final day of history? What if the final day of history is going to end in a few moments? Where do you stand before God? It could. Matthew 24, verse 36, but the day of the Lord, or but of that day and hour, knoweth no man. Not the angels of the heaven, but the Father only. That again flies in the face of how there's been so many of others who have tried to predict uh, the final day of the history. I mean this not in a harsh way, but they just don't know what they're talking about according to God's Word. Not according to me, but according to the Bible. They don't know what they're talking about. And anyone who wants to predict the final day of history and says it's going to be on a certain day is a liar. Because that passage says no man knows. Now we can hope, well, I'll live till I'm 80 years old and, and that way I'll have done what I want to do in life. Basically what we're saying is maybe the Lord will let me last that long through my sinful life and then right before I pass away, I'll, I'll be able to, to, to change things. Matthew 24 and verse 43. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known and what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. 
He says, it's like the thief. The Lord will come as a thief in the night. If you know when the thief's coming, you can be ready for it. But you don't know. We don't know when the Lord's going to come. We don't know when the final day of history is going to be, but we can be ready. And we must be. Look with me at the final verses. I'm not going to be able to spend as much time on them because time is getting away. But look at verse 11 and follow. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, listen to this question. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt for hey. He said, that's what's going to happen. All this is going to be destroyed. And he says, well, what manner of person ought you to be? 13, nevertheless, we according to His promise look for new heavens and new earth where it dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace without spot and blameless. It says you need to be diligent. You need to be ready. You need to be prepared. When? You need to be prepared now and from now on. Verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. So many people fail to realize that. People live unfaithful to the Lord with the idea, well, well everything's going to be alright. They don't realize it's the long-suffering of God that gives you the very next breath so that you can repent. That's why you have the, the next breath. So you can repent and come back to Him. Even as our beloved Paul also concerning, uh, according to the wisdom given unto him, is written unto you. And then he, he talks about some things Paul said in verse 16. Quickly, let's look at 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. He says you need to be ready. You need to beware. You need to realize that every day is a gift from God that you can live for Him. And if you're not living faithful to Him, it is His long suffering giving you the opportunity to come back. In view of the coming day of the Lord, all responsible people should strive toward holy living and godliness, longing for that new abode that He mentions here. The admonition here is to encourage faithfulness. In the meantime, the Lord's example, uh, or the Lord's delay is an example of His long-suffering, His mercy, and His patience. There have been people who have lived a number of years and haven't come to God or have been members of the church and been unfaithful to Him, and because of the long-suffering of God, they've had the chance to change and come back to Him. But you know what? I say this sadly, there are multitudes who've had the idea of that opportunity, but they never lived to see it. And their last chance is gone. Some pervert the truth into their own destructions. Our faith needs to be guarded. We need to be careful that we live as God would have us to live. Because there is the final day of history that is going to be coming when we know not. And as we have surveyed this chapter as a foundation for the matters that we're going to look at in tonight's lesson, I want to encourage us to realize and to take to heart and seriously the teachings of this passage. Let us not listen to the scoffers. Let us not let those who want to minimize the fact of the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, let's not allow them to minimize it in our minds. But let it ever be before us that we may examine ourselves and strive to be faithful and live as He would have us to live. Being ready for that day. So that as the writer talked about, the new heaven and new earth will be ready for it. And we'll be able to enjoy it. This is a foundation for tonight's lesson. Brief overview of some of the thoughts of this chapter. We'll, we'll take it up further tonight. But I want to encourage us right now do we realize that the final day of history may be recorded before tonight comes? Might not be able to finish this lesson. Because, you know, someday there's going to be the last sermon that any of us will ever hear. This could very well be it. Where do you stand before God? 
If this were the final day of history, and the Lord comes again in judgment, where would you stand? 